first video, I would like to talk to you about royal mistresses. And there's three in particular that I'm going to talk to you about today. But if you would like a more in-depth video about any of them, because I'd like to do that, then just let me know. Just pop it in the comments and I can do that for you. So the first is a lovely lady called Nell Gwynn. Nell was the mistress of King Charles II and she was born on the 2nd of February in 1650. She was born in either Herefordshire or Oxfordshire. Even though she was adopted by the City of London and known as a London girl, she wasn't. <laughs> her father was a soldier who died when Nell was still quite young. He died in debtors prison and her mother was a boardy house owner which is sort of like a brothel. When Nell was 13, her mother sadly passed away. She got drunk one night and fell over and passed away. So Nell was taken in by one of her mother's friends and she started working in London. And this is where Nell gets into the theater. So Nell started working as an orange girl in Drury Lane Theater Royal in London. It's still there today. It's an absolutely gorgeous theater. It's one of my favorites. And what Nell would do is during intervals or before performances or even after, she would go around selling oranges. And this is where Nell got her love of interacting with the crowd and being a bit of a centre of attention. When she was 15 years old, Nell became the mistress of Charles, but not the second. This was who now referred to as her Charles the First, and that is an English actor called Charles Hart. Charles gave Nell her big break and she started working on the stage. She did some performances in some normal everyday theatre and it wasn't really for her. She wasn't the best at it, unfortunately. Nell's forte was comedy. The girl had timing <laughs> and she absolutely loved it. She was in her element when she was on that stage. The reason that Nell was able to work on the stage was because in 1660, Charles II came back onto the throne. He had been in exile and one of his first, literally one of his first things that he did was to open up the theatres and allow women to perform on stage. And that's where he found Nell. He saw her in a play and was like, I want some of that. <laughs> By 1668, Nell was 18 years old and she was also the official mistress of Charles II. He'd had mistresses before who had had his children, but Nell was a little bit different. She was a complete contrast from people that he had been with before she was a normal person normal everyday person like me and you and i think that really helped charles he felt a lot more comfortable around Nell than he did anyone else on the 8th of may in 1670 Nell gave birth to her first son and she called him charles after his father as far as acting was concerned Nell didn't want to just be the king's mistress. She wanted to be an actress, because that's what she loved. And with her mistress title came lots and lots and lots of roles. All these authors were jumping over themselves to get to Nell because they had written so many plays specifically for her. She became so famous and she was loved throughout London because of her being one of them. She's one of them and she's shacking up with the king. And that made her very popular. Charles saw Nell as a bit of a safe haven. He knew that if he were to go to Nell's house, he could see her as, you know, the person that he have, he didn't have to be king around her. He could relax, he could chill out and he could just be Charles. He didn't have to be King Charles II. And that's why he liked her so much. But Nell had a jealous streak in her. When Charles took another mistress, Louise, Nell came up with a couple of um, choice nicknames, shall we say, for her. One of which was called Squintabella, and the other was the Weeping Willow because she was constantly crying. 
at the ripe old age of 21. 21. Nell retired from theatre life. It was at this time that she was also given a gorgeous house. It is number 79 Pall Mall. It's still there today. It's absolutely beautiful. And it also has one of those lovely little blue plaques telling you that Nell Gwyn lived there. Nell would go on to have another child by Charles and his name was James. He was born on Christmas day in 1671. But unfortunately, when he was nine years old, he passed away. He'd been sent to live in France and he died from an injury. The only thing that we know about his death is that it states that he had an injury to his leg, but this could have been multiple things. It could have been anything from an infection to poisoning. So unfortunately we won't ever find out why James passed away, but he was only nine years old. By now, the king had not grown tired of Nell, but had moved on to different mistresses. He was getting older. He was a lot older than Nell. Nell was only, you know, in her 20s. And they had become much more father-daughter figure than mistress-lover figure. He would help her. He would talk to her. She was there for him. As I said, they had that relationship where he could go to her and talk and just relax and chill out. And that's what they loved. The thing that hurt Nell the most, I think, was that she wasn't able to say goodbye to the king when he passed away. The king's famous last words were, let not poor Nell starve. And to me it shows how much he cared about her it wasn't just a sexual relationship it was genuine compassion and caring and that's why i love Nell so much she was nothing but herself and she she had a good life for being who she was and that's why i like her so much the next mistress I would like to talk about is someone that you've probably heard of, but you don't realise that you've heard of her. So I am not going to sing this song, but there is a song written about this woman. <laughs> and it is the Daisy Bicycle for Two song. I'm, I'm not going to sing it. Daisy was her nickname, given to her by all of her friends and her family. That's what she was known as. But her real name was Frances. And she was born on the 10th of December, 1861 in London. When she was three, her father died, but her mother remarried. She married a man called Robert, and he was the fourth Earl of Roslyn. Daisy's father had a, a very large estate, so when he passed away, Daisy became an heiress. She had something like £40,000 a year by the time she was about nine years old. So yeah, she wasn't exactly scraping the bottom of the barrel when it came to money. Her stepfather was very close to Queen Victoria and at one point in her life, Daisy was actually thought to have been a really good match for Prince Leopold, who was Victoria's youngest son. He famously suffered from haemophilia, but the match never really took and Daisy ended up marrying someone else. So Daisy became the Countess of Warwickshire and they moved into Warwick Castle. I've been to Warwick Castle numerous times. It's absolutely beautiful. If you haven't been, I 1 million percent recommend it, mainly because there are wax figures in a section of the house, all based around Daisy. So when Daisy was married, she became a major socialite. She was in all the papers, everyone knew her, everyone loved her. She would throw fabulous parties. Daisy and Francis became part of what is known as the Marlborough set. This was a group of dukes, duchesses, um, a Portuguese ambassador, and it was all ruled over by the Prince and Princess of Wales, which was Albert and Alexandra. This set was a bit scandalous. They were not afraid of having affairs with each other. It was at these parties where Daisy met Lord Charles Bersford. I think I'm saying that name right. And they began an affair. 
he told Daisy that he loved her. She fell head over heels in love with this man, even though she was married. And she was assuming that he was no longer having any relations with his wife. But Daisy found out through the grapevine that Charles's wife was pregnant. And she went crazy. She completely flipped out and ended up writing a letter to Charles's wife telling her that they were having an affair, telling her that he was going to leave his wife for Daisy. She was not happy at all. In fact, Prince Albert himself had to step in. He threatened Charles's wife with their social standing. If she was to tell anyone what the letter had said, then they would no longer be accepted in polite society. So she gave up. She took Charles back and stopped threatening a divorce. But by now, Daisy was no longer a threat because she'd been plucked from Charles by none other than Prince Albert Edward. He fell in love with Daisy when he saw her and she was actually a bit of a threat to Princess Alexandra. They were so close. She would host parties at Marlborough House instead of Alexandra hosting them. A bit like Nell and Charles, Daisy and Albert would go on to become friends. Their affair would eventually fizzle out and he would genuinely see her as a safe haven and a friend. He'd spend plenty of time at Warwick Castle with Daisy and her family. As I said, Daisy is someone who I've known about for a very long time because of going to Warwick Castle. But it wasn't until looking into her that I realised how interesting she was. The last lovely lady I would like to talk about is someone that I've always had a bit of a misconception for. She's a little bit modern. She's someone who is very misunderstood. And that is Wallace Simpson. Wallace Simpson became the mistress of Edward VIII when he was still Prince of Wales. Because I've got so much to talk about with this young lady, I am going to skip her backstory. I'm not going to talk about when she was younger. I'm going to jump straight into when she first met Prince Edward. Wallace was born on the 19th of June 1896 in Pennsylvania in the United States. Mayfair 1928, the Roaring 20s. Wallace is on her second marriage to a man called Ernest Simpson and they've just moved to London. Ernest was an American businessman and they decided that they wanted to move over to London. It was at this time that Wallace was introduced to a lady called Thelma. Thelma Furness. She was a Viscountess. And she was, at the time, the mistress of Edward. Thelma and Wallace knew each other for quite a few years. And then in 1931, Thelma introduced Wallace to Edward. And Edward fell hard for Wallace. He just became completely besotted with her. And she loved it. She relished in it, you know. Out of Edward, she got jewels, she got holidays, she got homes, she got social acceptance. In 1934, Thelma was gonna go on a trip to New York and she asked Wallace if she would be able to look after the little man. The little man being Edward. This would turn out to be a major mistake for Thelma because once she came back from New York, she saw the difference in Edward. She saw that he was no longer talking to other women. He was only interested in Wallace. If they were in a room, he had to be right next to her. They were inseparable. Edward dropped all of the women. He no longer spoke to any of the mistresses or any lovers that he had. It was all Wallace all the time. On the 20th of January, 1936, unfortunately the king died and Edward became king. This is where everything changed. Wallace now realised how deep she was into this. She wasn't able to just be Edward's mistress. Edward wanted her to be his wife. 
and this is where my opinion of Wallace has changed. I always thought that Wallace was this home wrecker who, you know, ruined the royal family. It's not true. She actually didn't want to be queen. I'm going to read you something, and this is a letter that Wallace sent. The letter reads, I cannot tell HM I'm going because I know what would happen. So I'm really telling him the old search for a hat story. I shall stay safely away until after the coronation or perhaps forever. One cannot tell. To me, that does not sound like a woman who wanted to be queen. It doesn't even sound like a woman who wanted to be with Edward. I think what happened was she loved the status. She loved having the excitement of being a mistress. And when it got serious, she got scared. That letter was written to her husband, Ernest. And that letter was written a couple of days before they were due to get divorced. She was divorcing Ernest to be with Edward. And I don't think she ever wanted to do that. During the entire time, Wallace was Edward's mistress. None of the UK papers had announced anything about Wallace. But there is actually a picture of her. There's a video footage actually of Wallace on the day that his proclamation was made. She doesn't seem like she's taking it very seriously. Edward so badly wanted to marry Wallace that he went to Parliament and the Prime Minister and said to them, I want to marry Wallace, what can we do? What can be done about it? And the then Prime Minister said, no, can't happen cannot happen. If you marry this woman, it will cause a constitutional crisis. Edward approached the Prime Minister about having a morganatic marriage, which basically meant that him and Wallace would get married, but she would not be classed as queen, and any children that they would have would not be heirs to the throne. But even this was said no to. I think at this point, Wallace was very much relieved, thinking, right, it's fine, you know, I can just go off of Ernest and I don't have to worry about this, I'm not able to get married, but no. Edward decided to abdicate. On the 11th of December, Edward publicly announced that he was abdicating the throne. And this caused such a problem in the royal family. His brother Bertie would then take over and become king. And that is why we now have our Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth wasn't really meant to be queen. There was a big hoo-ha in the royal family about Wallace. One, because she was American. Two, because she had been divorced. Three, because she was a mistress. And four, is because her and Edward had made up little nicknames for everyone. Like the Queen Mother became the cookie or the Scottish cook. And they actually referred to Princess Elizabeth as Shirley Temple. But this hatred and, well yeah, that's the only word for it. This hatred carried on and Wallace's divorce went through with Ernest. In May 1937, Wallace's divorce was finalized from Ernest. She was no longer married and she was free to marry whoever she wanted to. But on the 3rd of June, 1937, so only a couple of weeks after the divorce, Edward and Wallace were married in France. To me, on her wedding pictures, she doesn't look happy at all. She doesn't look like a woman who's happy about being married. Their wedding was very small, and even though Edward thought that he was going to have the backing of his family, not one member of the royal family turned up to the wedding. It wasn't for many, many years until the family accepted them. They were invited to a plaque opening to commemorate Queen Mary. And there's brief footage of the Queen talking to them. So there you have it. Those are my three favourite historical mistresses. If you'd like any more in-depth videos about any of those three women, then just pop it down in the comments. 
have you got any favorite royal mistresses if so just drop them down there and we can talk about it but thank you very much for coming to my channel and i cannot wait to make more of these videos until next time see you later